Well, my experience was I was home on that Sunday afternoon watching the Cardinals on television play uh, with my iPad in my lap. I was watching the uh, local radar and I was uh, talking to the National Weather Service on NWS chat and about 4.30 things seemed seem to get rather dicey. So decided it was time to come down to the Emergency Operations Center, which is like three miles from my house. Uh, came to the Emergency Operations Center, got here about 20 minutes of, started watching the weather, talking to the weather service, talking to our people in the field, uh, talking to emergency managers to the west of me over in Kansas, on across the Kansas state line, and things just pretty much started to deteriorate from there. At about 5.11, decided to turn on the sirens because it was obvious that some sort of tornadic activity was approaching the city of Joplin and coming into Jasper County. At about 17 minutes after, the National Weather Service warned on Jasper County in general and the city of Joplin specifically. And then we turned on the sirens a second time, approximately oh, around 5.30. Uh, first record of a touchdown was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 5.38 to 5.41, depending on which agency you listen to. After that, things just pretty much started going south. Uh, after I turned on the sirens the first time, uh, the local radio station called me and wanted to know why the sirens were on, so I was talking to them on cell phone, and then they quit talking, and I couldn't understand for a moment why they hung up on me, and then I realized the cell phones were down. And then, of course, the phones went down, the cable went down, a lot of the communication lines that we had went down. We had backup communications, but it took a little while to get them back online. It took probably in the neighborhood of 30 to 45 minutes to get everything back up and running. It, uh, we had generators that uh, kicked on automatically, but you have computers that have to reboot. Some of the electronic systems have to come back up. It takes a little while for them to warm up, log back into them. Some things honestly didn't work. Uh, cell phones, for example, we could do some texting, and the communication via the cell phones was just very, very sporadic. And in today's world, and particularly in emergency management world, everybody talks on cell phones or they send texts back and forth. Uh, the phone system that we have here, of course, is PBX, uh, which we had generators to keep those running, but we had many phone lines that were ripped down, and so it took a while for the alternate phone lines to be able to get kicked in and, and to be able to be used. We have ham radio. Uh, that helped a lot, but there again, it's a, kind of a point-to-point -point thing. It took a while for the ham radios themselves, the ham radio operators, to get up and get dispersed so we could be able to do some communications through them. Uh, later on, we had satellite phones that we were able to use, satellite communications devices that others brought in, and that helped a lot. Uh, the city has an 800 megahertz radio system, which by and large was not affected by that in that we still had our towers, we still had our repeaters, but it was, uh, it was just totally jammed. Everybody was trying to talk at the same time. Uh, we had some problems with the uh, channels, and uh, once we got those straightened out, and I'd say probably again within that 45 minutes time period or so, we were able to start talking to the state and talk to a lot of the locals as well. Fire, yeah, actually, I think the, the police department was already in the field uh, when this happened. They were doing some watching of it. Uh, we had two fire stations that were destroyed uh, at the time. The one fire station, our firefighters went inside the building and hid in a small room along with a couple uh, citizens that came by. Their station was just docked down almost flat. The other fire station, the crew was out on a call and uh, had only gotten back in a very short amount of time, and that particular truck was partially destroyed and their building was destroyed as well. Uh, of course, as soon as that happened, we started calling for help. Other help came in, and we have automatic mutual aid agreements with several of the various areas around the, uh, various agencies around the area. And they came in, we set up some command centers, we set up some staging areas, and then started doing search and rescue. Probably the, the biggest thing that we found that we had to deal with was just understanding the scope of what had happened. In the city alone, the track was six miles long by three quarters of a mile wide, some 1,800 acres. The entire track of the tornado from the city into Duquesne next door, uh, into the county, and then down into Newton County, where it made a turn toward Diamond, was about 13.8 miles. Yes, we had a lot of people lose their lives. At current count, we have 159 deaths, and somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 1,100 injuries. We're not sure exactly how many people were injured. Uh, we lost a major hospital. Uh, we had helicopters that literally we had one on the pad getting ready to lift off, two others in the air waiting to land. We had fixed wing aircraft coming into the local airport, medical aircraft. They said it looked like LaGuardia with the amount of planes that were coming in. At one point we had, am we had ambulances stacked up four wide and 20 deep. 
that were standing by to take people. And so as soon as they got somebody, they took them to the area hospitals. And we get name and, and that type of thing, you know, but it took a long time to do some searching to see where these people finally wound up because many of them were then transferred to another hospital. The fog of war happens all the time. You just have to accept that it's a fact and you have to, it's kind of like managing cats. You uh, pretty much have to know that it's going to happen and keep your eyes open and not get too frustrated by it. And once you get a little bit of time to calm down, you can start checking with people and find out what actually happened. Right now we figure approximately 7,500 different structures were destroyed, maybe as many as 8,000 dwellings, although FEMA counts each individual apartment as a separate dwelling, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 to 550 businesses. Uh, we approximate somewhere in the neighborhood of 17,000 citizens were affected by this tornado when it came through. Uh, housing is scarce at this point. Uh, it's a boom for the realtors. Uh, in most any house that can be sold is being sold. Uh, I personally know of some areas, uh, some houses in my housing area that the house is sold and never put up a sign. Someone just came by and said, are you interested? Uh, rental property is at a premium, trying to find it. It's very difficult. FEMA has been a big help. Uh, they've come in with manufactured housing. Uh, the problem with that is it just takes a while to get the structures done right. They have to come in and inspect a, a particular trader court. Uh, it has to be brought up to FEMA standards. They can bring the trader in. They talk to some people, uh, select their candidates. Uh, we have some fields that we're putting up from scratch, but you have to run utilities. So it takes a little while to get that done. At the height of this, you could not find a hotel room within a 70-mile radius of the city. Well, the first thing that we're having to do right now is the debris management itself. Uh, we have some estimated 3 million tons of debris that has to be hauled off and, and gotten rid of. At this point, on this date, we're about anywhere between a third plus done with that, and we hope to be finished by the first week of August and getting all of that debris hauled off. The second thing you have to do is knock down the structures that simply cannot be rebuilt, those with one wall or two walls, and there's a large number of houses that the people just took the insurance money and walked away, and for whatever reason. So those houses have to be dealt with in terms of nuisance orders, and then they have to be knocked down and have to be hauled away. The silver lining in all of this is this is a golden opportunity for a rebuilding effort. Uh, I know we need jobs, but there's going to be a lot of construction jobs in the next several years. The city and the community at large has formed a task force of concerned citizens, architects, city personnel, business leaders, uh, laity leaders that have all getting together to talk about what do we want to, this area to look like? Do we want parks? Do we want uh, running paths? Do we want schools in this area? How much of it's going to be residential? How much of it's going to be commercial? This is a chance to really change the face of Joplin. Well, it's all been positive. Uh, no, we don't have at this point a, a, a good idea. There's no architectural plans or anything like that. Everyone wants it to look nice. Uh, we do want a lot of trees. Goodness, we've lost so many trees. We've, we have an arbor uh, committee that is uh, coming in to uh, do an assessment of our trees, which ones can be saved, which ones can't, and then make recommendations as to what we should plant and where we should plant them so we can get some idea of, of normalcy back where we used to be. Well, uh, two things. One, it suggests the fact that this is an EF-5, winds in excess of, five, of 200 miles an hour. Being able to survive such an event is a remarkable thing and is not always the case for people, particularly in houses that are quite a bit older, as those were in that area, some 75 plus years old. The other thing it tells me is that I'm surprised that there aren't as many fatalities as what we had. We're talking an area that was maybe 17,000 people. Now obviously not all of them were home, but with just shy of 160 deaths and maybe 1,100, maybe 1,200 injuries in a population area that could have had as many as 17,000 people, that's quite remarkable that it would be those low of the numbers.